Good morning. Happy Father's Day. I think everybody in the room either is a father or has a father. And afterwards, maybe we can ask Cornelia about whether the ghosts and the monsters and the demons have fathers as well. I'm Marcia Reed. I'm the Associate Director at the Getty Research Institute and also one of the curators of the Dung Wang Caves show. Today, it's a great pleasure to introduce our most favorite storyteller, Cornelia Funke. She's best known for her fantasy and adventure stories, particularly the Inkart Trilogy and Mirror World. Her most recent books, as you know from even the coloring pieces of paper that you have, feature genies and ghosts and dragons, and there are more than a few books on the ghost hunters. Her books have sold over 20 million copies around the world. It seems as though Cornelia and her characters travel far and wide. And this is Cornelia's first, third appearance at the Getty. And sometimes after listening to her stories, I think that at the Getty Research Institute, we probably need to give her an honorary scholar position which focuses on global research on ghosts and other fantastic creatures. And maybe today we'll even temporarily change our name, which is where we abbreviated as GRI, so this is really easy to do. But we'll call ourselves the Ghost Research Institute. Good idea, huh? <laughs> it seems as though for Cornelia, there's nowhere that the ghosts don't go and that they don't hide out waiting for people to search for them find them, and be surprised by them. For today's episode, Cornelia's imagination has been stimulated by the cave temple show, and so she's going to talk about some of the creatures in the caves. And afterwards, she's also going to be signing some of her most recent books upstairs. Lastly, please do turn off your cell phones, because from now on, we're going to be receiving communications from other times and other places. So let's call Cornelia. Cornelia, are you ready? Cornelia, help me. Cornelia. <laughs> thank you so much, Martha. And thank you so much, all of you, for coming, although it is Father's Day, and although it is outside as hot as in a frying pan. Um, what we're going to do today is, because you will hear about Chinese demons and monsters, um, I asked one of the curators of the exhibit to teach us all a little bit of Chinese so we can deal with the demons and the ghosts. So I promise you, when you get out of this room, you will know a few Chinese words, thanks to Julia Grimes. I hope you are better at pronouncing it than I am. Okay. Hello, everyone. Welcome today. Um, today, as Cornelia mentioned, we're going to talk a lot about ghosts and demons in China. And so we need to know how to communicate with them and how to call them by their proper names. So to begin with, let's learn how to say hello. All right. So it's ni hao. OK, it's like you're on an elevator. The first part, the ni, is like said very much like this ni. All right. And you're going up like a question. Ni. And then how goes down and then up again. How. All right, so let's put those two together. Are you ready? Okay. Ni how. Ni how. One more time. Ni how. Very good. Very good, everyone. All right, let's go to our next word which is a very, very important one. And I actually get this question a lot from people. They say, Julia, how do you say the name of your show? I don't know how to say that word. What is that? And I tell them, well, it's an oasis town in northwest China near the Gobi Desert. And this is how you say it in Chinese. Dun Huang. So you're going to start off the first part, the D-U-N. It's going to be like you're singing. It's going to be very high. It's going to be very flat. It's going to be very level. Dun. A little bit louder. Dun. 
very good. And now we're going to go up like we're in that elevator again or like we're asking a question. Huang. Huang. Yep. So, dun huang. Yeah, that's it. Dun huang. Yeah, that's how you say dun huang in Chinese. All right. Yeah. All right, let's see what, oh, this is an important one. There's a lot of sand around Dun Huang, as you might imagine, because, well, it's on the edge of the desert. And there's a lot of sand in our story, too. Yes. Blows about. Um, so we should probably learn how to say sand in Chinese, too. Sand is said like this, Sha. Sha. Yeah, it's that high, flat, level tone again. Sha. Sha. One more time, Sha. Sha. Let me hear all the kids say Sha. Very good. Let's hear all the adults say Sha. Sha. Very good. <laughs> wow. The well, adults the are very brave today. I think so. Yeah, usually very the children are much louder. Well, they're going to hear about the ghost, so they have to be brave. You know? like, yes, that's true. That's great. All right. Let's see what our next word is. Oh, yeah. Speaking of being brave and the ghosts, <laughs> let's learn how to say the word for ghost in Chinese. It's a little tricky because we're going to go down, then we're going to go up again. It's like we're in that elevator. All right, and that U, you, you're going to say like it's a W. Okay, it's like a W sound. All right, so it's going to be like way. Very good. All right, so you're going to go down and up again. Way. One more time. Very good. Way. Yeah, that's how you say ghost in Chinese or in Mandarin Chinese. All right. So we've got one more word here. Ooh, another really scary thing. This is how you say monster. Now, there are a lot of monsters. There are a lot of words for different kinds of monsters in Chinese. But this is kind of a standard monster. This is like a Shrek kind of monster, all right? So we say it's both. These are called falling tones. So they go down, down, all right? So it's, we say, it, remember that U again, you're going to say like it's a W. So you say Y, ooh. Let's try it again. Very good. <laughs> Everybody got that one like right off the bat. Why? Woo. Perfect. Why? Mm. Woo. That sound. Yeah. Remember that second W, your, your mouth's going to get a little bit like, ooh, ooh, ooh. You're not going to say so much of a W. It's a very soft one. So, why? Woo. Very good. Excellent job, everyone. Show the face on how Julia will help us a few times during the story because we will have to do some, well, let's say calming people down or calming ghosts down and waking them up and she will help us with that. So what I will do is, I usually, for these events, I always write a story and it will end up in a notebook like this, you see? And then mostly this notebook later on goes into the archives of the DRI. And in it, you see all my research and my drawings, because I often draw the creatures I have in a, in a story to imagine them, because I'm both an illustrator and a writer. And uh, then you hear, see at the end, my handwritten manuscript, because that's how I always write a story, first of all, you see? And then, so that I don't do it like this when I read, what did I write there? I typed it, and the story, in itself is because we have a few young ones here, quite long, so what I thought is, I chopped it into three pieces. And after each piece, I see whether you have any questions, whether you want to talk about anything that you heard, and then we continue. Is that your plan? The story is called The Singing Sands. Oh, William Dampier loved the moon. All ghosts do. Moonlight has a very special effect on them. It brings back memories from their past lives, memories so precious that not even death can erase them. And Dempier had much to remember. He had been a cartographer, a writer, an explorer, an adventurer, and, no need to deny it, a pirate. Ah, yes, the foolish things we do in our lives. Dampier looked up at the moon, a shining silver coin above the treasure-filled halls of the White Fortress, and sighed. Its light made him remember ships under sails, treasure lost and found, glory and shame, so many memories. 
Time to get out of the moonlight, old fool, he thought. But the fortress looked even more beautiful on nights like this. The stone covering its walls seemed to absorb the moon's light like a petrified sponge. It had come all the way from Italy and carried memories of a long lost ocean. A closer look still revealed mussels and water plants in its pale white surface. Yes, the fortress high above the streets of Los Angeles told stories even with its walls. William Dampier had been the Getty's guardian for almost 10 years, watching its vaults and halls to make up for his sins as a living man. He had stopped the rampage of a porcelain monster and dueled the ghost of a king. But now, an exhibit had arrived that brought challenges both the living and the dead guardians of the White Fortress had never encountered before. Dampier walked over to the stairs that led down to the tram and looked down at the tent that had been raised next to the tracks only a few weeks ago. It contained, under its dome roof, three caves that had come all the way from China, and many more artifacts were exhibited at the GRI. Karen Trentleman, who ran the SLD, the secret laboratory for the detection of ghosts and other uninvited guests, at the Getty Conservation Institute, had been inspecting the incoming treasures for months, using all the tools that GCI had developed since another exhibit had brought a medieval demon to the Getty. This time, the treasures were even older. The three caves alone were filled with replicas of more than 1,500 years old sculptures and paintings restored by Chinese artists who had come all the way from the Silk Road to bring a long forgotten past to Los Angeles in images of ancient gods, jade demons, and robbers, nine headed monsters, and. Dampier creased his ghostly forehead and stepped closer to the white steps that filled every day with thousands of visitors. What was that? A huge figure was sitting at the bottom of the stairs. Impressive, isn't it? Coyote had a way of sneaking up at one side that could even make a ghost skin crawl. Coyote had guarded this hill for much longer than Dampier. He claimed to have been here for 15,000 years, but with Coyote one never knew. There's three of them. His maid is walking around in the gardens with a very annoying cup that's the size of a bison. Dampier cursed the moon and its distracting effects. Why did you not let me know earlier? Why should I? I like them, and you would have made me chase them away. The lion at the bottom of the stairs stirred and shook its mighty mane. Then it threw back its majestic head and roared into the night. The Dampier had never heard any creature utter a more impressive sound, neither living nor dead. It resonated like the chime of a huge bronze bell all through the white fortress, causing its walls to tremble as if they were waking from sleep. Another roar answered in the distance, and a hot wind rose from the gardens, blowing through Dampier's ghostly shape and covering his boots with desert sand. How did three beasts like this get past Karen Trentleman's ghost ray machines? Dampier asked in a low voice, while the lion slapped the steps of the stairs with a tail as long and thick as a boa. Only one ghost had been allowed to come with the Dunhuang treasures to the Getty, Yue Zun, the Buddhist monk who had carved the very first of the great caves of Dunhuang out of the bare rock after he had had a vision of a thousand golden Buddhas coming to the desert. He was almost 1,700 years old by now and a very wise and gentle soul. Bill! Coyote nudged Dampier's knee with his pointed snout. Someone was shouting. Someone, no, Dampier could hear many voices and hoofbeats, and he looked up and a shadow moved over the silver face of the moon. The blossom of a flower landed on his shoulder. What the? He caught himself just in time, no cursing, Dampier. What sense did it make to be a ghost if one couldn't better oneself? It's impossible that all this gold got past Trentleman's machines, Coyote asked. Yes, it was. They had to find you at Zoom. Dampier's ghostly silhouette usually had a grayish color framed by a fine line of silver that turned dark red when something upset him. The ghost, 
who was floating with crossed legs above one of the vitrines in the GRI's exhibition rooms, was of a very different color. His small silhouette shimmered in bright greens and violets, the colors of the heart and the crown chakra, as he would have explained with a smile. Yuetsun had been a Buddhist monk in his lifetime who had traveled many dangerous roads, amongst them the caravan routes of the famous Silk Road, a plundering ground of many robbers because of the riches transported on it from east to west and west to east. Yuetsun had been a pious and humble man. He still was, although he was the reason for the existence of one of the most magical places on earth. The vitrine above which he was floating contained the Diamond Sutra, the first book ever printed in this world, though for Western eyes it didn't actually look like a book. Yuizun was so absorbed in it that he had neither heard the lion's roar nor noticed Dampier approaching, but one sharp bark from Coyote made him turn transparent and almost crash land on the vitrine. Coyote could be terribly rude. Yuizun, ni hao, Dampier said. There is something out there I, I need you to look at. Well, actually many things, creatures to be exact, of clearly foreign origin. Three of them are probably lions. Yuizun let himself sink to the floor until he stood on his bare feet. Creatures, Captain. Yes, I'm embarrassed to say that I can't name them. Dampier said while the monk's ghostly aura colored the GRI lobby violet and green. Especially the flying ones, although I'm a well-traveled man. Things had got worse outside. The hot wind Dampier had felt at the stairs was filling the night air with sand. It was covering tiles and walls, lawns and trees, forming waves of yellow grain that made Coyote sneeze and filled Dampier's boots when he stepped outside. Oh no! Yuetsun exclaimed, the singing sands, how did they follow us? Dampier exchanged a worried glance with Coyote. The singing sands were once called by a goddess to cover the remains of a beaten army, Yuetsun explained, while he was walking with hasty steps at Dampier's side. Coyote was already far ahead, snapping angrily at the sand the wind was leaving on his fur. Mm, so maybe those are the ghosts of that army? Dampier asked, pointing at the dark silhouettes of a dozen riders galloping past the museum's entrance. Yuetsun stared after them and shook his head. Mm. No, Captain, he said. I fear those are members of the robber gang whose story is told in cave 285. Sadly, before they were turned into holy men by the Buddha. The robbers from cave 285, Dampier murmured. As far as I remember, there are 500 of them. Yuzu nodded and looked up when a few flowers landed on his head. Are those the creatures you could name, Captain, he asked pointing at a swarm of flying women drifting over the night sky like nymphs through black water. They are Apsaras, quite benevolent creatures most of the time, he added while brushing the flowers from his shaven head. The huge lion was still sitting at the bottom of the stairs when they reached them. A sure, the guardian of all sacred places. Yuizun's voice was weak with awe and worry. Did he bring his female companion? They usually come in pairs. Oh, yes, Coyote growled. She's as red as a bougainvillea flower and don't, didn't take it well when I told her misbehaving cup to stay away from a cactus garden. Mm, the question is, how did they all get here, Yuzun? Dampier lowered his voice when the sure turned his head as if he was listening up the stairs. I may know the reason, Captain, Yuzun whispered back. I'm sure it was not his intention. He's a good man. Well, a good ghost. He, Yuizun nodded, his bad conscience deepening his violet color. I saw him at the caves when I was meditating in one of the empty niches. He got here in one of the Bodhisattva statues. He said he fell asleep in it after working all night on a Buddha painting in Dunhuang. He had no idea he'd come to another country. Sounds like the GCI has to improve the efficiency of their ghost ray machine, Dampier murmured. The sure let out another roar when the robbers galloped over the tram rails. Dampier counted more than 30 this time. The sure lifted his paw and wiped eight of them off their horses, which made the others attack him. They looked like locusts attacking a huge cat from the distance. 
Dampier was sure they wouldn't look like that for visitors stepping out of the tram. He moaned. 500 robbers, desert sands, three huge lions. The flying nymphs throwing flowers were clearly the least worrying part of this invasion. At least it was Sunday night. On Monday, the fortress was only open for scholars and employees, and most of them had seen ghosts before. Everyone at the Getty knew about the GCI secret lab and how often the treasures of the past brought also its ghosts. Dampierre had just comforted himself with that thought when Coyote uttered a deep growl. Above the tram, right in front of the auditorium, a creature was plowing through the ever-growing sand dunes that made even Dampier's dead bones shiver. It was almost as huge as the Shur, but its body resembled a snake on legs. Far too many legs, not to mention its nine heads. Oh, kind me, Jason gasped. Ah, yeah. The monster was heading in their direction. It wouldn't take long to reach them with all those legs, and no one could say on whose side the shore would be. To the caves, Coyote! Dampier grabbed Jewison and threw him over his shoulder. The caves! Coyote barked. They're in a tent, and they're mostly made of mulberry bark paper. Why not the GRI? Since when does it matter for ghosts and demons what the walls are made of? Dampier yelled back while he jumped down the flight of stairs that led down to the tent in at least some distance from the shore. I trust the same is true of nine-headed monsters. We need to find the one who causes all this, and as far as I remember, Yuezun saw him in the caves, right? Right, it came from Yuezun. The shore turned his head and followed them with his eyes. Wells of demon fire that burned like red suns in the sphere's face. But he didn't move or lift his paws to catch them as he had done with the robbers. Maybe one guardian recognizes the other. The robbers sadly proved to be less respectful. A few dozens of them swarmed out from behind the tent that held the caves when Dampier had just reached the bottom of the stairs. Thirty more galloped over from the tram station. They chopped off Coyote's tail, luckily it grows quite quickly, and Dampier lost his head when he was barely a dozen steps away from the cave tent, which was very annoying. He had to put Yuezun down and leave him in Coyote's care to go in search for his head, amongst the trampling horse hooves, fighting at least 20 robbers of his sort. He chopped off a dozen arms, legs, and heads before he found his own head in a trash can. He was adjusting it on his shoulders when six of the robbers surrounded him, their faces grim with delight at the prospect of chopping him into very small pieces. Dampier was just wondering how long it would take the GCI to restore him, if the human guards found him the next day as a heap of ghostly shreds, when a flash of violet and green made the robbers turn their horses. The next instant, they were all on the ground, scrambling for their swords, while Yuzun smiled his gentle smile and bowed, wiping the wrapping of an ice cream off his mock robes. Yuzun, Dampier coughed, trash can his head had landed in was filled with sand. Why in Neptune's name didn't you tell us you are a master of the martial arts? You are a fast-acting man, Captain, the monk replied. I found myself on your back before I could inform you of my skills. Coyote returned from chasing the fleeing robbers to report they were heading downhill for now and that the Kai Ming was chasing rabbits in front of the Getty Trust building. So Dampier and Yuizun finally entered the tent that held the three cave replicas while Coyote was staying outside to raise the alarm in case any attacker came back. And this is the end of the first part. How are you feeling? Who wants to do questions? Who wants to listen? You are undecided. You have to help me with the decision because you are the masters of this uh, morning. So, who has a question to ask? None? Is it the heat? Okay. Where is the hand? Can you just get up and ask the question? are you most proud of? What I'm most proud of? Ooh, that's a good question. Well, I've written 62, so you can imagine that's quite a difficult decision. <laughs> I think I'm most proud of the books that made it really hard for me. So there are two books, The Thief Lord and Reckless, The Petrified Flesh. They nearly broke my back. So I had to write 15 revisions until I was happy with them. 
and I'm the proudest now. That's probably how in life it is always, right? When something is really hard and you manage to do it, it makes you feel quite good about it. Any other questions? Do you see anything? Look at you all. It's very silent. There we go. I don't see anyone. Does anybody else see one? You just broke the record of the audience with the least questions in the world. <laughs> and believe me, I've been to audiences in all the world. Okay. So let's blame it on the heat and on Father's Day. And I will just continue to read the story. How about that? Okay. Lights down. William Dampier had spent many blissful hours in the three caves built from mulberry bark paper and wood since they had arrived at the White Fortress. He had made himself invisible to watch the Chinese artists who had brought their skills to the Getty to make the experience as magical as possible. And he had counted the days until the first visitors would fall silent in front of the miracles that had come such a long way to enchant the city of angels. Nothing seemed to disturb the cave's nightly peace. They seemed silent and empty. But you had soon whispered a name into the darkness. Shuang, Shuang, are you here? And there came no answer, and all they found in the first cave was the statue of a bodhisattva and of two shirts watching by his side. The original cave had been carved and illuminated almost 1,600 years ago, at a time when the Tumash had fished and hunted amongst stone oaks, where now Los Angeles spreads labyrinths of streets and houses. This is most likely the place where the Shur come from, Yuezun whispered, pointing at the two lion sculptures. There was a ghostly shine to their freshly painted golden eyes. The second cave was empty as well, except for a Buddha clad in red who had lost his face to the teeth of time. Two Indian gods, Shiva and Indra, were painted onto the walls to his left and right. Yuezun stepped forward to inspect them more closely. Oh, thank the Buddha, he said, relieved he didn't work on Shiva. I wish the same were true of the robbers. They were galloping all over the cave's left wall, the same way they had chased Dampier and Coyote outside, in colors as fresh and bright as if they had been painted just minutes ago. Yuezun whispered, waving Dampier to the third and last cave. We need to stop him. The third cave that had come from Dunhuang held four especially beautiful statues, a Buddha accompanied by two bodhisattvas and a disciple. Cave 320 enchanted Dampier even more than the other two. Its walls showed two images of the Western paradise, one ruled by the Buddha of infinite life, the other by the Buddha of infinite light. And Dampier had lost himself many nights in it, studying all the dancers and musicians, sitting amongst lotus flowers, each of them painted so masterly that he had often believed to hear their ancient instruments, filling the Californian night with music from the Silk Road. Now, though, both he and Yuezun had only eyes for the lean, ghostly figure standing in front of the paradise on the left, a fine brush in each hand, porcelain bowls filled with dissolved color pigments at his feet. The painting had been brutally harmed in, in the original cave by an American archaeologist named Langdon Warner, who some said had been the model for a movie hero whose name escaped Dampier. Warner had used glue to tear off part of the wall painting. He had intended to take the whole paradise with him, but only the upper part had come off, tearing a hole into the stunningly beautiful image. The piece Warner had torn out is still in Harvard, but obviously the ghost who was taking his brush to the empty space was determined to restore the painting to a, its full old glory. I, I, yeah, I, yeah, the painting ghost murmured. Will I ever get this right? Will I ever heal this wound? He nearly dropped his brush when Dampier cleared his throat behind him of some sand, of course. Master Yuzun, the ghostly painter exclaimed when he saw the monk standing by Dampier's side. Another roar from the shore took the tent and made the cave's walls shake. This time the painter had heard it too. 
His ghostly silhouette turned very white. Yes, it's a show, Shu Hong, Yue Zun said softly. Didn't you promise you wouldn't exercise your art on these walls? We both know how powerful they are. Shu Hong bowed his head, blue paint dripping from his brush. But I had to, Master Yue Zun, he exclaimed. Look at them, they are fading. All the beauty, all the memories, fading until all that's left are the singing sands. Yuezun stepped to his side and put his hand comfortingly on his uncle's shoulders. One day, yes, he said, nothing lasts forever in this world, but not yet for many people take care of the caves of Dunhuang, here and in China. They keep the memories fresh and the beauty. Your art, though, does more, Xu Hong. It makes the images come to life again, and they shouldn't. Not in this place, so far from home. You released the 500 robbers. They chopped off my friend's head. The sure are here, swarms of apsaras, even a Kai Ming. We can be glad you didn't finish the yaksha yet. Xu Hong raised his head and stared at you with some wide eyed. I did work on the yaksha in cave 285, but I didn't finish him. Not yet. Dampier and Yuizun exchanged a relieved glance. Shu Hong, Yuizun said, we will need your brush to make this right again. But it will have the right words this time. You have to call them back, all of them, and make them sleep. Shu Hong's face lit up like the faces of the enlightened bodhisattvas on the wall. Oh, yes, he murmured. I can do that. Master, I'll go to work immediately. And he grabbed his paint and his brushes. Make sure you don't forget any of the robbers, Yue Zun called after him. What is the meaning of this? Dampier shook his head. Yue Zun smiled and drew a few lines of light onto the cave floor with his finger. This, he said, means sleep in Chinese. And this, he drew another sign, means peace. Zhu Hong will write these signs onto the walls wherever he walks somewhere. He straightened up. We will have the opposite task, Captain, or don't you think we may need some help to get rid of all the sand? He drew a few lines of light onto Dampier's jacket. This means, wake up. Dampier looked at the sign on his chest and frowned. Yeah, you are probably right, he murmured. We may need some help. And you are for sure a wise man, you assume. But I hope you don't intend to call a helper who tears off my head. I really don't like the feeling. Yuizun's answer was just another gentle smile while he wiped the sign from Dampier's jacket. And now we need Julia's help again because you will have to learn those words. And this time it's really important. Yeah. So you know? It's getting very urgent. They need to learn the words quickly, as do we. So the first word that they learned, they weren't learned the words for sleep. So these are both falling tones. They're both going to go down, down. So, and again, that U, we're going to say it as though it's a W. So it's shui, okay? So it's going to go shui jiao. Perfect. Shui jiao. That's how you tell people to go to sleep. Shui shui jiao ba. Shui jiao. Go sleep. Shui jiao. Good job, everyone. Great. Let's go to the next word. Okay. This one's a little tricky. This is the word for peace, all right? And so we've got to go up in that elevator, and then we're going to go flat, all right? That high tone again. So it goes up, ping, like a question mark, ping, all right? And then un, high, flat, and level. Un, yeah, ping, un, ping, un. Repeat after me, ping, un. Good job, everyone. All right, so that's the word for peace. Oh, and this one's really important, too. I don't know how many more of these creatures they want to wake up, but in case they need to use it. This one's a little tricky. We're going to go down and then up again like a question mark. So, and the X is going to be said like an SH, like a SH sound, all right? So, xing lai. Very good. Let's try that one more time. Xing lai. Yeah. Good. It's like we're in an elevator. We're going down, and then we go up again, like halfway through the Xing. All right, so Xing Lai. 
very good, everyone. That's how we tell people to wake up. Sometimes we say xing qi lai, but xing lai, yeah. Very good. Perfect. Well, perfect. I am very impressed, I have to say. When they stepped outside again, they found Coyote barking at an Apsara who was especially persistent at showering him with flowers. When Dampierre asked him whether the robots had shown up again, Coyote growled, shown up again. They are like mosquitoes swarming all over the place. And that giant lion took the frog statue off the stairs with his tail. I don't like this bill. The stairs had by now disappeared under a firm sledge of sand. The white fortress had turned into a desert fortress, guarded by a huge Chinese lion. No, Dampier didn't like this either, although he had to admit that it all looked quite impressive under the full moon. We're working on it, he comforted Coyote, but we need to get over to the GRI. Would you mind guarding the caves meanwhile and make sure that these robbers don't disturb the ghost painting in there? Painting. Ping on, Coyote, Dampier replied. Shui Zhao, maybe you can murmur those words from time to time while you're watching. Excuse my accent, Yu Zin, he added. My Chinese was never that good. It would probably have taken any living man or woman many hours to wade through the dunes back to the GRI. Even the two ghosts felt the strength of the hot wind that was spreading layer after layer over stones and plants. A caravan of camels was making their way to the gardens below, and the ghosts of lonely pilgrims were standing between the tables and the chairs of the cafetiera. But luckily, Xu Hong's brush hadn't raised the army that was supposed to sleep under the singing sands. Yes, Dampier, look at the positive side, always the positive, the old pirate murmured, while the wind once again hit him so hard that it tore an arm from his ghostly body. Jue Zun caught it before it was whirled off into one of the canyons surrounding the Getty Hill. I'm so desperately sorry, Captain, he said into the howling wind while he reattached Dampier's arm to his shoulder. I should have told you about Zhu Hong immediately. How could I underestimate the power of an artist in a place like this? The bows looked like thinned and rugged 2,000-old-year-old carpets when they finally reached the GRI. And as hard as they tried to get the sand out of their clothes, they left a fine trace when they made their way to the exhibit rooms. Yui Zun clearly knew where he was heading. He walked hastily past the vitrines with the Buddha preaching and the embroidery, the silk banner with a bodhisattva holding a glass bowl, and the altar diagram to finally stop in the last room in front of the statue of a warrior. Those! Depia looked in alarm at a second and very similar statue that was standing opposite the warrior Juizim was looking at. You want to summon those? Don't you think we're in enough trouble already? These are two heavenly kings, Captain, the monk replied. And I promise, any of the two will be of great help. Even the Kaiming will obey them, in case Xu Hong won't call it back in time. And of course, I will make sure I won't release the demon that Chen Wang, as we also call the kings, holds down with his left foot. You can't see it, but I tell you, it's there and quite nasty. In fact, maybe we should add another Chu Zhao, although my finger sadly won't have the power of Chu Hong's brush. Kuizun drew the sign with his finger onto the wall, right next to the Chuan Wang's lifted foot. Dampier couldn't help it. He still felt quite worried about the helper the monk intended to call, and of course Yuizun noticed. May I show you something, Captain? He said, lifting his hand. It usually helps very well against the fear. This is the mudra of do not fear. Julia can do it much better. Zun explained. Do you feel how it comforts your heart right away? Can you show them? Is, there, is that the only version? or? Yeah, th there's one version. It's called the Abhaya Mudra. So it's the Do Not Fear Mudra. And it's sometimes done like this, very rigid. Other times you may see a version where it's more like this. Like it's a little bit looser. The fingers curl somewhat. But in general, it's done this way. I always love about it that, in a way, it almost feels like we have to let the fear go through, right? Yeah. If we would do it like this, and we probably would, the fear would just bounce <laughs> again and throw us off. But if we do it like this, the fear goes through. Yeah. 
The Mudra helped indeed. So much that Dampier wished he had known about it when he had still been alive. He stepped back, performing the Mudra, while Jiuzun bowed deep in front of the statue. Jianhua, Ninao, the monk said, we ask you to come to our aid in times of great need. We have a misbehaving wind and far too much sand and a band of robbers who still have to find enlightenment. Of course, he said all this in Chinese, and this is William Dampier's translation, so it may be slightly flawed. The Sutra Yuezun added was such a flood of Chinese words that Dampier didn't even try to understand it. So he just stood there, holding up his hand, while the monk filled the holes of the GRI with rivers of sacred words. Dampier was already wondering whether the sun had risen and the first scholars were making their way up the hill when suddenly the statue stirred and turned its head to look first at Yuezun and then at the guardian of the White Fort. The heavenly king gave a brief nod of acknowledgement to them both, and then he began to grow, until his head hit the ceiling with a clang. Wait, Jianhua, Juizun called up to him. This should be enough for now. Please follow us outside before you show your true size. The heavenly king frowned, but he followed them. One of the vitrines split when he stomped past. The Chang was by far the heaviest ghost Dampier had ever seen, and he was very relieved that the glass windows of the lobby didn't splinter when he stepped through them. The sand was more than three feet high by now, and the shirer had obviously become very bored with watching the empty steps. It was standing in front of the museum entrance with his wife and his cub that was at, indeed at least as big as a bison. The Chang Wang gave it all a very strict look, and then... He began to grow higher and higher into the sky, which was pale with the light of the upcoming morning, although the dawn was hidden behind veils of sand. Dampier thought that Chan Wang would grow until his head reached the sun, but when his shadow fell all over the Getty, from the GRI to the gardens, he seemed to be satisfied with his size. He took a deep, deep breath and inhaled all the sand. He even inhaled coyote, who had just chased the robbers into the cactus garden, having a lot of fun with that. But the Chan Wang cuffed him out when he barked so loud that the heavenly king felt like a drum that was beaten from inside. His cuff whirled coyote onto the arch that frames the entrance to the GRI, where he, she didn't find amusing. There are days when coyote wishes the white fortress had never been built on this hill. And this day was definitely one of those. The robbers were still picking the cactus needles out of their ghostly skins when the heavenly king's breath threw them off their horses. And they would probably have whirled all the way into the Jianwang's gigantic mouth if, yes, if Shu Hong had been busy at work at the caves. His brush had made most of them disappear already, but the 500 robbers were not very good at counting, which made them fight over their booty all the time. They hadn't noticed that by now there were only 16 of them left. Another eight faded while the breath of the heavenly king carried them towards the GRI. Coyote was still standing on the arch, licking the Chan Wang's ghostly saliva off his fur when they came whirling towards him, including three horses. Anyway, Coyote snapped at a robber flying right over his head, but before he could shred him between his teeth, he faded and disappeared into thin air. The rest ended up in Chan Wang's mouth. But by the time he spit them out, they disappeared as well. The heavenly king gulped and looked around, and what he saw made him very pleased with himself. The white fortress looked as if a thousand invisible hands had polished the singing sands of its tiles and walls. Zhu Hong had also reason to be satisfied with himself. On the rails of the tram, the canning was fading just when it had begun to gnarl at the iron tracks with all its nine heads. Another had made its way to the museum fountain and was talking to itself when Chu Hong's brush called it back to cave 285. It is quite entertaining to talk to yourself when you have nine heads. Only the Shur was still standing by the stairs, frowning down at his cup, which was escaping its mother's paws. The cup was the first to disappear. All right, everyone, let's whisper so we can get the cub to go first. Shui jiao. Shui jiao. 
Then its mother faded in the early morning light, like a dream the night was calling home. All right, one more time. Let's whisper so the mum can go home. And finally, the male sir, giving off another of his bronze bell roars, disappeared. All right, let's send him home too. Fantastic. I think we will keep you all here. Dampier would miss the sure. He knew he would. The heavenly king was yawning. So what about him? Dampier whispered to Juizong. The heavenly king said something in very old Chinese. He says he would really like to go back to the exhibition. Juizong translated. And so the Chen Wang did, leaving the fine line of sand behind. Dampier and Yuezun were cleaning it away when Chu Hong came rushing into the GRI, still a brush in his hand. Did I forget anyone? He gasped. Yes, you did, Coyote growled, standing between the vitrines, a flower on his head. Oh, of course, Chu Hong exclaimed, the Apsaras, and he turned to rush back to the caves. Wait, Dampier called after him. Maybe we can keep them for another day. I think the scholars would enjoy them. And so it happened, although Coyote didn't like it. The Apsaras threw flowers from the sky until the sun set, and Chu Hong finally called them back to the caves with his brush. The next morning, when the first people got off the tram, the Getty was unchanged. Just a few visitors thought they heard the crunch of sand under their shoes, but they blamed the Santa Ana winds. So, are there any questions now, or do you want to be released into the heat? Let's see. I thought you, I thought you said that the uh, story was three sections, but it was actually two. I skipped one. You caught me. Because you didn't have any questions, I would have done the intermission for the question. But as you didn't have any questions already in the first intermission, I skipped the second. So, was, was that? that I'm very pleased to hear that. We're wondering if you could talk about the inspiration of The Princess Knight. Yes, I can definitely talk about that. That's a picture book I once did with a wonderful German illustrator called Kirsten Meyer. Um, it was uh, a time when my daughter Anna, who is now 26, was four years old, and the only cover, color she wanted to wear was pink, and the only dresses she wanted to wear were princess dresses. And I, as I always was a pirate by nature, was very upset to have a princess as a daughter. So one night I thought, I'm gonna write a story. And actually I did two. Another one is called Princess Pigsty. Uh, to somehow deal with my princess of a daughter, who turned out to be a, quite a glorious princess. Uh, but that was the first inspiration. And then of course my secret wish to be a knight. Thank you for making it a bedtime story. <laughs> Any other? Hi. I Hi. noticed um, this is, we were here last year and just enjoyed it as we have this year. I noticed that um, Coyote and Dampier have made their way into your story again this year. So it seems like you're developing quite a relationship and connection with those two characters, yes? And the, should we see them continue on with your yes. further readings? Yes, and I, I always, sadly we didn't have the time this time, but I really want to do some illustrations on them. You know, so far we're piecing it together with the photos we have from the exhibit, but it calls almost for, for book illustration. And um, I have wanted, when I created Dampier, who is a historical figure, he actually was a pirate and a cartographer, and you can look him up online, he exists. Um, 
and Coyote, I wanted to show the two sides of Los Angeles, you know, because there's such a modern side, we all know that. Then there's all the history that comes to the Getty and all the treasures held here in seven walls, by the way, um, under the GRI. And um, then there's, of course, a layer of Los Angeles that's so much older. And I thought I have to bring in the Native American myths to mix it all together. And that is, of course, for a storyteller, very enjoyable to work with all these layers. And this time, when you look at the caves and the exhibits at the GRI, well, you can write a thousand books about this. We were here last year too. Is there anywhere we can find like a published version of this if we wanted to reread it? You know, I think you can find it online on the Getty um, GRI site, but what we plan to do is, and that at least that's our plan, we want to do seven stories based on seven exhibits. So we have three by now, and we want to make them into little books that are in a box, that's at least what we imagine at the moment, and illustrate them beautifully and then publish them. Because of course the shorter stories, it's a problem to make them into a nice format that you can read them properly, but that is at least the plan. So sadly you will have to wait probably a little longer. Oh, uh, did I write or illustrate when I was very young? Interestingly, I did, but I didn't notice. I think many of us have that, that when they look back at their childhood, they suddenly think, oh, I always liked to do that, but I didn't really think about it. I was the only crazy person in my class who looked forward to writing essays. Um, I was the only one who was constantly drawing and giving horse, I had to always do horse drawings for all the kids in my class. I never thought about it. And when I was 18, my uncle, who was a, a, a teacher of art, said to me, well, you have to be an illustrator. And I was like, no, no. I'm going to change the world. I'm going to be a social worker. The world needs some saving. It still does. So that's when I went into social work. But then I was drawing and telling stories for the children all the time, which te teaches us that some talents are in us probably, and we have to live them. So I became an illustrator first. And when I found the stories that publisher sent me so utterly boring, I one night decided to write one story myself. I had never thought about writing. I never thought I could be a writer. I thought a writer is a mythical creature, either dead or very old, and for sure not a real person. So I became a writer almost by coincidence, or if we believe in those. I was already 28 when I published my first book, which I had also illustrated. But it took me another three books to realize that actually I like the writing as much as I like the illustration. And it's interesting, in the last few years, the illustration is coming back with a vengeance. So I'm, I'm uh, even when I do things like this, I showed you, there are drawings in there. Because by now, um, when I write by hand, I just finished a second part of a, of a st book that was very much loved by American children, a dragon rider and I just finished the sequel. And um, I, for the first time, drew the characters first and then wrote about them. And that is quite an interesting thing, how that shifts and changes in your career. Any more? How much time do you spend at the museum uh, to write your stories? Ooh, when I get a story like this, I have to almost hold myself back to spend not too much time because I also have to do other things while I'm doing this. But usually I come up here three or four times to meet with the curators and to see the whole exhibit and, um, and talk with them about the background. Julia, for example, gave me a long you know, tour about what do I see? Because I think all of you have, who've been to the caves feel almost blind because we don't understand so many things we see on the cave and it was magical to go with her through it and she pointing out the gods and demons and fantastical creatures and it was as if a whole new world opened. So this was especially rewarding. 
Before that, when I did the Louis XIV exhibit, that was also wonderful because then I get these calls that say, Cornelia, want to, do you want to come up to the museum and we spread out all the things so you can look at them? You can't, you imagine I get stumble over my own feet getting to my car coming up here. So it's, it's, um, it's a very magical collaboration and doing the stories is my thank you in a way for all the research that the Getty Research Institute did for me when I prepared a book set in a fictional 19th century. Because I came up here and saw in the photo archives uh, photo albums from the 19th century that showed, for example, Japan, China, but also Europe, and make you feel almost as giving, getting a glimpse at a lost world. And that helped me so immensely with that series that I thought I want to have a way to pay it back. And that's why I do these stories. I can't wait to do the next one. Yes. Uh, which language do your stories come to you in, and do you find a difference depending on which language you're using? Well, I, I am originally uh, German, as you hear in my strange accent. Uh, and I still write my, my thick books, the, the long prose in German. But currently, that starts to shift. I've lived in America now for 10 years. And my daughter has been living in London, so I go back between England and America. And my main language by now is English. So if you would look through this notebook, you would be surprised what a wild mix of English and German this is. So um, I write short story by now in English. I started doing that when I wrote, uh, worked with uh, classical musicians in America and in Canada. And for example, to then have a translator between you and the artists you work with doesn't make sense at all. So, um, and then I started to write short story working with artists here in Los Angeles um, on, on a digital project, which was very interesting because I first of all started to write just in English. And at the moment, I'm working for the first time on a, let's call it a thicker book, because I'm currently working on a novel adaptation of the Pan's Labyrinth, Guillermo de Toro's movie, because he asked me to. And that to make, to have a text which is a Spanish language movie with English subtitles done by the director, I cannot add German to the mix. <laughs> so I have to write it in English. And as Guillermo writes, writes in two languages, he knows that feeling very well. And uh, it's quite an adventure. You should see me. I sit at my desk with my notebooks and this huge dictionary next to me that has every German word in it, hopefully. And um, learning while I'm doing this, all subtleties that I don't know yet about English. So it's a very, very interesting process to live in two languages. Uh, how long does it take to write the short stories from this? A short story, you know, is sometimes like, for example, I wrote the first draft of this story in three mornings in a cafe in London. So drinking my coffee and eating my eggs. Uh, I, but the research had been almost a month. So for a short story, it's a very different relationship between writing and concept. So first of all, to do the research, to think about it, then you almost distill it from a huge amount of things to this short form. Whereas when you write a novel, it's very often the working along. I'm at the moment starting a book that um, I did research for half a year for. But while I will write it, I will keep on researching. So that will take me about two years. So that's, that's why it's so wonderful to do short story in between, because you can work on something else. So I was just curious um, if you could explain more about what you're doing with Pan's Labyrinth. Oh, because, yeah. oh God, now I'm, I'm in trouble again. <laughs> because the HarperCollins get so angry with me when I talk about it already. Um, it, you can't believe it takes longer to, write con to sign contracts than writing a book. Um, so, but Guillermo is fine with it, so I will tell you a little bit, but don't talk about it too much outside this room. Um, so, for nine years, I have one movie poster in my writing house. I have a small writing house in my garden, and it's Pan's Labyrinth. For me, it is the greatest masterpiece when it comes to fantasy, because what it does, it does, it tells a very political story, and at the same time does it with the tools of mythology. So uh, I have been, um, the first 
thing that happened was a few years ago that I got a letter from Guillermo del Toro, which made me very starstruck because he's been my favorite director for a long time, saying, Cornelia, I really admire your books. Shall we dance? Which was a very gracious invitation. <laughs> and uh, I worked on a project at DreamWorks with him, and my only task was to meet, I think, six times and play with him in the story. Oh my God, yeah, I would have paid for that. But DreamWorks paid me for it. So the next thing then was the dragon story. Um, that um, Guillermo did a wonderful book on his notebooks. His notebooks are sensational. I don't know whether you know them. And I think it's called The Chamber of Miracles. And um, in that you see all his preparation. He's also a brilliant illustrator of all his movies. And he asked some of his friends and collaborators to ask to write a preface to um, each movie. And I was asked to write the preface for Pan's Labyrinth. So that was our next step in our collaboration. And then last year, he called me and said, you should think about this, but would you be willing to turn Pan's Labyrinth into a novel? And I had to sit down. Because this has no movie has been my favorite movie for all ages. You probably all can imagine how that feels. It's a crazy endeavor. It's complete madness to turn those images into words. But uh, I couldn't say no. So we found a way. We, we, we decided on a form. So what it will be is, it will be because I respect this movie so much and the more, believe me, I study it, the more my admiration grows, uh, that I will write a very a true to the movie retelling of it on the one hand. But what I will do is I will add a few short stories about certain aspects that are hidden in the movie or that are not elaborated on. That will be in my voice because Guillermo wanted me to play. So. Uh, I have no idea when this will end. He at some point said, you will get lost in this, Cornelia. <laughs> and that may still happen, but I hope I will be done in summer next year. Any more? Who is your favorite author? Ooh, good question. Ooh, at the moment, I would say that is probably Neil Gaiman. Um, you may not know his graveyard book yet, so most of his things are quite dark, but he's one of my favorite authors at the moment. And then there are, of course, obscure German and Swedish authors you have never heard about, uh, like Michael Ende, who wrote The Never Ending Story, was always one of my favorite storytellers when I was your age and Astrid Lindgren, who wrote Pippi Longstockings. She was my favorite, favorite, favorite storyteller when I was your age. There's a book she wrote called The Brothers Lionheart. I'm not sure it's translated into English that I still love very much. So, are you ready to be released into the heat? Or you want to stay here? Well, I thank you very much for coming, despite Father's Day.